Good afternoon. That was weak. Come on, Hoffman. Give me a big Canadian welcome. Here. There we go. All right. I get... <laughs> Nobody is interested, actually. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Always offend the Canadian people. I don't know how. I always do. Oh. So I get the pleasure of introducing uh, Serena Sachs, CIO from Fulton County. I had the opportunity to go in there um, and find out what they were doing around personalized learning. I spent a lot of time in school districts talking about this topic. Um, and, you know, in different, at different levels, people are doing some cool things. But when I saw what they were doing, I was like, we need to amplify this message. Um, so um, for those of you who don't, don't know me, my name is Adam Gary. I manage our global education strategy at Dell. Um, so I do get out uh, quite a bit to see some of this stuff. So I think that what you're going to hear today um, is pretty awesome. And the questions that you have, make sure that you ask them, because she really just wants to share as much as she can. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Serena. All right. Thanks, Adam. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me at 4 o'clock, the end of a long day, I'm sure. Can I get a show of hands? Uh, who's from a K-12 district? Oh, wow. A lot. OK. And higher ed? All right, I've got some of those, too. And I assume others are corporate or some other kinds of things. So uh, let me see what the slides say. Whoops, that's the wrong way. Thanks. Any questions? Well, now the, the audience is all warmed up. I'm ready to go. All right, so some of the things that we're focusing on is innovating in teaching and learning, transforming education. Uh, and that's through personalized learning, and I'll talk more about what that means. Um, uh, the critical role that technology plays in it, but there are a lot of other things that are critical as well, so I don't want to overemphasize the technology. And then finally, how Dell has helped us from an education standpoint. A little bit about me. I have about 25 years in Fortune 500 companies, and then I saw the light, and I thought, oh, I want to transform education with technology. Leveraging technology to help kids learn and reach their potential is, is my purpose. And so I'm just thrilled to be able to be at Fulton County where uh, I was able to join a team that was already doing amazing things and just lend my voice. And uh, that's why I'm here to share and, and help others. And I'm just real excited about what we're doing. Um, at 25 years corporate, I was at Florida Virtual School. I was CIO of Florida Virtual, which is the oldest and largest K through 12 online school, totally virtual. Teachers and kids both in the ether. <laughs> Only the IT people came in, which is ironic. Uh, and I have uh, several certifications kind of work my way up. Um, Fulton County is, is a very interesting place. It's north and south of Atlanta. Uh, it's actually two separate pieces of land. You actually have to drive through APS to get between the north and the south. And it's 70 to 80 miles long. Very, very large geography and very diverse student population. It's majority minority, 50% free and reduced lunch. But what makes it interesting is the South is nearly 100% Title I, and the North is almost 0%. And then the Central section is a very high uh, English as a second language, uh, English language learners. Uh, about 52 languages spoken in the district, and about 10% special ed. We have set some lofty goals. Uh, our former um, superintendent, Dr. Vosa, is now in Palm Beach, and we just talked about the folks from Palm Beach, uh, set the goals of 90% graduation, 85% college readiness, and 100% career readiness. These are very lofty goals for a district with this kind of uh, persona. So the way we went about, or we are going about, reaching these goals is, is my mic, did my mic go out? Oh, I'm okay, all right. Is uh, through personalization of learning, and, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. So, Better than me telling you all about what personalized learning is, even though I will after this, I want the kids to tell you first. The kids really understand it. So let me see if this works. It worked. Sometimes it's you pass out a worksheet or we're taking notes in the lecture, and it's barely even learning at that point. We're just copying down information and maybe retaining a little bit of it. But there's other days where we're working on a project and we're solving problems and the teacher comes to just me. There's just so many more avenues for students to take when they're learning. Where I really learn is where I get down and do a project and things that you have to talk, discuss things through, which I like a lot. Just having the ability to have something more tailored to you 
and just allows everyone to get a more in-depth <laughs> knowledge. You spend a lot of the time in school, you learn stuff that doesn't really feel like it applies to what you want to do in college and later in life. I think it's just, it just gives us more of an option to be more prepared for what the real world is going to be like. I feel like there's a lot of students at this school and in other schools in general that have a lot of potential, but because of the way the education system is set up, and how it's very generalized and you know there's always a set curriculum and that teacher has to meet this set requirement that is hard for each individual student to get the attention they need you know to prosper and thrive so I feel like you're definitely that personalized learning experience would help the student. Individually talking to students about their issues or about what they need um, changing the class up so that everybody kind of gets what they're trying to get. Teachers are generally pretty broad with what they teach and this is help, helping make it specific to each student. Like this is providing a connection to each topic with every single student in their own way. And it's up to them to create the connection. I really do think the personal device is a good idea because you'd be able to Honestly, working at your own pace, which is so important because not everyone learns in the same way. Everyone learns differently. We understand things differently. We interpret things differently, and it, some of us take longer to understand something, and others it doesn't take any time, or we already know it. So if a student learns better with a video rather than the textbook, a personal device would make it easier, so you just find more topics interesting. And then with a device, there's so many cool programs on there that you can produce a ton of different stuff. So like projects would be really cool. We'd be able to work well with people a lot easier because it's it's tricky to like work in groups because if you're not in the classroom, let's say you get home and then you remember you have this group project to do and everyone's you know at practice or something. So if we had these devices, everyone could work on it in their own homes, kind of at their own time, and everyone could add into it and then it would be just like, it could come together to be something really cool. I think learning and the joy of learning really comes from understanding it and being able to use it wherever. I think it would open the gateway to do this um, individualized learning approach because then you can you can write, you can write a narrative about it and on your iPad and the teacher can read it. You can draw pictures on it. You can really do anything you want without having the limitation of a worksheet. It'd be really flexible and can create a more easy way to give out assignments that are more broad and more open to new ideas. If you put more time and more effort into your education now, then it's definitely going to pay off. Yeah. You know, I feel like it make kids like get it through their heads. Mm -hmm. So every time I watch this, I see something else in there. But what struck me this time is everybody learns differently. And that's what personalized learning is. When I see kids like this doing collaborative learning and using the technology for assignments, I think, oh, how can they, you know, it, it's sad when you see a classroom that is just plain direct instruction and kids aren't able to be themselves and voice their, their learnings and, and share and help each other. So uh, I think the kids said it so well. Um, this is kind of a simplified version of what personalized is and what it isn't. And uh, personalized learning is, it's kind of a buzzword in the industry, and in, in some it strikes fear in their hearts, and in some people it gets them really excited. For me, it gets me excited. As you can tell, I'm really passionate about this. And so I was surprised to learn that a lot of people are really afraid of it. They think that personalized learning is about kids sitting in corners buried in a, in a computer screen and not looking up. Or they think that uh, it, we're trying to outsource teachers. And we're absolutely not. And we're, and we're also not eliminating direct instruction. Direct instruction still plays a critical role. But there are a lot of elements of personalized learning so that each student can learn what they need to learn, when they need to learn it, and how they need to learn it. And, and that's what we're going to go into uh, a little bit further. Um, and I love the, the tagline, our best one-to-one -one device will always be great teachers. That helps people calm down when they hear personalized learning. Believe me, my board reacted very well to that line. Uh, this is one of the reasons I came to Fulton County. When I wanted to go to a brick and mortar, I, I asked folks in the industry, which district is doing the most to transform education? And I was told, it's Fulton County. And they, about a year and a half before I got there, I've been there about a year and a half, they had worked with a consultant uh, in Gartner to lay out this framework. And there's a very detailed plan, which you'll see a snapshot of later, too. This is, this is on our website, so I know people are taking pictures, but the plan and 
the framework and everything's on the website. And if you ever need anything, you can get in touch with me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, but the noticeable thing on this is, is not how many boxes there are. And there are pages behind every box of what we've done and, and the plans. But that technology is only one of those boxes. It's remarkable. It's only one. It's a huge piece. I mean, we know as technologists how much effort and work and planning goes into infrastructure and the devices and the support and all of those things. But if you learn one thing from this presentation, that's a very small piece of the larger picture. Changing hearts and minds, getting teachers to integrate technology into their instructional practices is the most time consuming and difficult and challenging piece of the whole puzzle. And we, will, we can talk about that a little bit more too. But setting up the, the standards, the curriculum, providing resources, digital content gets you a long ways. But we also have a lot of help and a lot of levels of support, a lot of scaffolding for the teachers to modify their pedagogy and their instructional strategies to drive student-focused culture, to do all these things that the teachers are comfortable with already. And then you can implement the technology. And one, uh, one of the things we're doing is we give the teachers the, the technology before we hand out to the students so that they have time to ramp up and learn. So one of the boxes was student-centered approaches. And you see personalized learning is on there. And that's a piece. It's a type of a student-centered approach. And uh, students benefit from the individually paced, targeted learning tasks that start from where the student is. A lot of formative assessment. And when I say formative, the student barely notices they're taking a test. They're not really taking a test. They're doing exercises. They're doing work. And the technology is reading that student's ability and level and their mode of learning from the formative assessment. So it's continual formative assessment that's, that's transparent to the learning process. It's part of the learning process, as opposed to the high stakes tests that we you know, are growing to really <laughs> want to move out of the process that, that take kids away from learning. Uh, demonstrated mastery, and you'll see another slide how we're moving towards mastery. So it's, if a kid gets a C in a class, have they really mastered the material? Or if they've gotten a D, if they passed, is that, is that really mastery? Are they ready? If they get a, a D in algebra, are they ready to go on to pre-calc or algebra 2? Probably not. So what we want to move more towards is mastery, competency-based learning, where students demonstrate mastery versus Okay, you have finished your seat in second grade. We are now going to advance you to third grade without knowing whether they've actually mastered the concepts. It's, it's not an easy road, but we are definitely embarking on that. And the next one is the students are engaged. <laughs> kids today are digital natives, right? They're born, you know, babies, kid, toddlers have iPads. They're swiping, you know, before they can talk. So they are used to engaging with technology. And unless we engage the students in the classroom, they're, they're just going to tune out. We're going we're to have a huge educational issue. But the students not only need to engage in the learning process, but they have to own their progress. They have to be able to see through data, through analysis, through dashboards, where they are and where they need to be, and actually get excited about going to the next level. And, and that's student ownership. And then finally, in this diagram, the learning happens anywhere, anytime. It's not confined to the walls of the school and it's not confined to the hours of the school day. That is where the devices and technology really do help, that your learning becomes any time, any place, any day. Uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of some of our digital curriculum, some of our resources. We have more than that. We actually are setting up a curation process. We have a person who owns our curation process, and uh, we're, we're going to have um, a white list of apps and technologies, and we're working on putting them in one landing place so that they're very easy to access. And ease of use is, is obviously critical for, for the learning environment. Um, facilities and materials. We've talked about the mindset, the hearts and minds of teachers and instructional leaders. They have to really get this journey. They have to get why they're doing it and what the benefits are and what it looks like. Um, but the next thing is the facilities. The way a classroom is set up, all the kids facing forward, teacher at the front of the desk lecturing, is, is not very conducive to learning. It's not very conducive to interaction. And even if you have the same furniture, and you just, I was just in a classroom yesterday, 
And they had the old-fashioned desks. It was a middle school. But they put the desks in pods. So they'd almost look like tables. And, and so that little adjustment helps the kids interact with each other. Um, but even better, you want furniture. You want walls that are kind of permeable, that there's more flow and fluidity in the learning process in the classroom. So a couple of years ago, we embarked in a charrette process where we engaged community, uh, educators, students, parents, and uh, district leaders designing a totally new concept for a school. And I, I'll show you a couple of minutes of it. I don't want to waste all the time on it. Can we fast forward instead of starting over? All right. Well, we could go back and look at it afterwards. So the thing that I want you to see is the flow. So there was, an, I mean, it is a cool video because just the way the furniture and everything works, you can see it's very fluid. and. Um, you want to be very flexible so you can move things around and, and change the learning. Whoops, I'm, am I doing that? <laughs> Put this down for a second. I use my hands too much. Um, did it go, it went back again or am I on the right side? Okay, all right, good. Okay. That's the right side? Okay, you're keeping me honest, cool. Um, so I was just at this school yesterday. I went to the new building. They don't have the furniture in yet, but they're laying all the carpet and the kids are gonna start coming in um, just to see the facilities, the teachers are getting trained on how to use it. But what's cool is you, so you, you have a pod of five classrooms that don't have doors. They all connect with each other. And then off to the side you have some rooms that um, they have some tables you can put some computers on. And then they have quiet study rooms. And you can close the door, you can have a group work session. In fact, what I'm, some of the things I'm looking at here is some large uh, touch screen panels so the kids can come in there and do their problem, collaborative learning with the touch screens in those work rooms. And then there's actually a stadium seating little lecture hall for each one of these pods with doors that do close so that you can have a, a straight lecture. And it's uh, you know stadium seating with the carpeted and you just see the kids having a good time there. So direct instruction could be a little less uh, boring maybe. Um, but very interesting and I would just say that you have to consider facilities and furniture. A lot of times you don't have the ability to build a new school but you look at the facilities you have by you, uh, in a different way and with um, different furniture options, and I would emphasize the flexibility is important. Um, so this, I, wanted, I promised you I'd show you a snapshot of our plan. So you saw beginning those um, four columns, and that's what we have here, the curriculum, the learning, and the tools and processes. We worked with you know, all the experts, the Clayton Christensen uh, Institute, Digital Promise. We're working with Ed Elements and um, Common Sense working with all the leaders in the industry to make sure we're doing these things right. Um, and some Kennesaw State University, we have a lot of help with our, with our plans and our programs. This looks like, oh, that's not such a big plan, but behind each one of those bars is, I assure you, a ton and ton of work. And uh, I don't know that any other district has been kind of this deliberate and um, put it in a framework like this. So, uh, and I am, I, like I, like Adam said, I'm happy to share. I think it's, it's really good stuff, and it's working well. Um, OK. No program would be complete without monitoring, feedback loops, continuous improvement. I'm sure we're going to do some things that need to be improved. And we do have a performance evaluation group within the district, and they are doing a rigorous assessment. We haven't finished a year yet with the new devices and the new program, uh, but we will and we'll be reviewing the data and then making tweaks as we go. So we are in the process of rolling out the devices. Uh, it, it is, um, I wanted to point out that we have a district strategic plan that is on our website, fultoncountyschools.org, and we wanted to make sure that this personalized learning, although it's not called out in the plan, so back in 2011, 
you know, 12 when this was being implemented, it didn't say part of our plan is personalized learning, but it, it said these other strategic initiatives which align to personalized learning. So the personalized learning is kind of the how we're achieving our strategic objectives. And this chart, I think, is a great progression. A lot of schools, including ours, started out as a low-tech classroom. You know, some people have a BYO, they have some technology, maybe calculators, maybe they have some projectors. Very low. You can personalize learning in a low-tech classroom. It's a lot harder, and it's not as interesting. Um, but you can start the mindset, even if you don't have the technology in the room yet. Uh, when you start to get to more of a high-tech classroom, and you put in interactive projectors and students have devices, you start building up that um, interactivity. But I would caution, you don't want your teachers to just use the technology as a digital worksheet. So you saw in that learning commons in Centennial High School, they weren't just sitting in a classroom holding a device doing a worksheet on a tablet. That, that, that doesn't really personalize learning. What they had did, done at Centennial is they really thought about their facilities. That was the old media center. And they got some seed funding to rip out everything that was in there. They took the floor down to the bare concrete and polished it. So it's a polished concrete floor. Put in that furniture that you saw in there. Put in the devices, the technology. And now it's a learning commons. And it worked out so well. And you can see the students enjoy it so much that we are doing that for every high school in the district. So we have a plan now for all 17 of our high schools to have a learning commons that's going to be even more high tech than that. So that was, that was a win. Um, we're moving towards blended classroom, and that's where the differentiation really comes into place. Uh, you might have uh, groups of people doing things in a different way. Uh, the instructors allow the technology to be used, and uh, it supports a continuous achievement. So students start advancing as they need to, or getting more remedial help and doing additional work if they haven't mastered a concept. Finally, and this is what we're moving towards that I mentioned before, is the competency-based classroom. This is where Students are assessed on the mastery of standards. You're still adhering to standards, but it isn't, it isn't necessarily an assessment. It could be an observation. It could be a report. It could be a presentation. The ways of assessing mastery of the standards without standardized testing. And that's what we're moving towards. And what we're building is these proficiency scales. We're using um, uh, Mar Marjan, Marjano, Marzano, thank you. The academic group is doing all these scales. I know we help them automate it. <laughs> Um, but that's what they're going to be using to evaluate. Uh, and this is where we are as a group. We divided all the schools. We have 100 schools. We divided them into five groups. And it's an 18-month planning process. Now, <laughs> what's interesting is you start getting this pressure from the board and from the parents and from the community. Well, where are the devices? Why don't we roll out devices? And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The schools have to get ready. So we've had to hold off the board saying, why don't we hold, roll out the devices already to say, let's make sure that the schools are ready, that they have their instructional goals in place, that they know how to best leverage the technology before we give it to the students. And that becomes challenging, is holding off giving out those devices, because people think that that's the answer, and, and it's not. Um, so our group one schools are, are rolling out. Um, our group two are in the planning process. And, and the others are following suit very quickly behind. But it's that, it's that planning process. And, and this is the process. So listening, simulation, two design workshops that are months apart. Uh, and they go through a personalized learning academy. Then at that bottom, second to last, they do the device selection. Second to last, towards the end. And like I said, the teachers get the device before the students. And how do we assess readiness? So readiness is more than 50%. It's at least 50% instructional. Do the teachers understand? Do they get it? Is the school ready? Do they have instructional practices, instructional goals? Have they differentiated learning even without the technology? Infrastructure, and I have Kenny Wilder, my director of infrastructure here, and he's kind of in charge of making sure all the schools have the right infrastructure in place to support one-to-one. -one. I have heard of districts rolling out one-to-one. -one without adding the access points and the bandwidth uh, on the backbone, and it's, it's not pretty. Um, and then and device readiness. This is a little more subtle. We kind of had to get our heads around this. Even when they've selected a device and they have, a, they have to have a deployment plan set, there's a, there's a lot of things to think through just from the device readiness. And I think I have a slide about that in a minute. But 
So school instructional readiness, going into that just a little bit more. One of the things that we focus on is digital citizenship. If you put a device in a student's hand, how are they going to act with that? Are they going to be thoughtful and responsible? And we, we also are training the parents to some extent. We have a video that the parents and the, studio, the students watch together. Digital citizenship is taught in the, in the classroom before they get the devices. And uh, it's about safety for them, but also non-bullying and not doing things that are going to harm uh, um, others or the network. Um, so we talked about the readiness and the, and the um, instructional plans. Infrastructure readiness, uh, it's kind of a, a picture of the heat maps. We have added, um, doubled our network access points, our wireless access points, and we're doubling them again. A lot of access points. And we've increased our bandwidth to the schools up to, uh, in the high schools, up to 10 gig per school. And then this is something that I've seen is fairly unique. Uh, I think some districts are starting to think about this because I've shared it with them. But when we decided to do a marketplace of choice for devices, I think that was a unique concept. And the idea is that it's not one size fits all. So we went through all this planning and having each school figure out their instructional plan and their goals and what are their students like. You have to let them decide which is the best device, which device is going to best serve their goals and their students. And, and there are differences. They all run the browser-based apps, and most of our apps are browser-based. But what's going to really enhance the learning experience? So back in last spring, we had four devices approved. The uh, Surface for Education, uh, Apple iPad, the Dell Latitude, and the Dell Chromebook. And so those schools have to go through that selection process, and their governance council has to approve it. And we actually make a point that if anybody's kind of a zeal it for any one of those, they're not on the selection committee. It, <laughs> it really has to be about the, the instructional practices. So if somebody says, oh, I know what we need, they're not on the committee. A uh, lot, of, lot of technology support in the back end. I'm, I'm sure most of you are in the technology business. Uh, Kenny has implemented uh, VMware virtualization, vSAN, NSX, Silverline, all the access points we talked about, uh, scalable bandwidth. Uh, we implemented Office 365. Dell helped us with that. Bob's in the room. You, thank you for all that. It was big rollout we accomplished this summer, uh, last spring, summer, fall. Took about a year, um, but great win for the students and for the teachers and the staff. So it's, it's really going to be a, a great tool for our schools. And device management is support. I'm happy to hear that Dell just bought uh, EMC, which owns VMware, which owns AirWatch, because we own a lot of AirWatch licenses. Uh, and that's our mobile device management solution. And this is Kenny's infrastructure chart. So if you have any questions about that, he will stand up and gladly answer those. <laughs> Yeah, so after my presentation, we're going to go back to this one, and he'll stay for 45 minutes or so. And go. Well, but I, I will just say, and giving Kenny a lot of kudos, I mean, in, in addition to everything we just showed you that we've been doing, we actually moved our location. We consolidated 11 administrative buildings into two, and we moved, we're in the process of moving our data center from one location to another. And that sounds like a nightmare in the middle of all this, but it's actually been a benefit because it's allowed Kenny to construct this very advanced uh, data center with all the newest technology. And he presented at VMware. <laughs> so lessons learned. Very important to have strong partnerships between IT, academics, instructional tech. I talk to director of instructional tech um, probably three, four, five times a week. Talk to academics almost as, uh, almost as often. Um, but we're very, very much in sync. Uh, it's been a huge help. Um, our PMO processes were already established, so just running this like a project uh, and, and working closely with procurement has been helpful. Did a lot of extensive research to establish this marketplace of choice for the devices and also for the digital curriculum. And then I, I can't stress strongly enough adherence to standards. Uh, being LTI, common cartridge, and now one roster compliant and asking all of our vendors to comply with that is a huge benefit. It makes it so much easier to get the digital curriculum in and the data. So I hope you'll all join me in making sure our vendors support those standards because that's going to help all of us. I'm, I'm actually on the board of IMS Global and uh, very strongly in favor of everybody using those standards. So we had a first successful 
rollout of the one-to-one -one for this program, uh, the beginning of school, and that's uh, Autry Mill. And uh, they're pretty happy. And we've done a few more since then and, and more coming. So it's, it's going really, really well. And I'm looking forward to the actual quantitative results to show how much more the students are learning. And, um, and I think that the teachers are going to be really happy about it, too. I think it's a, it's a big win. So with that, John or Adam? Got me now? Okay, there we go. So, um, Adam, why don't you take us through um, kind of Dell's point of view about personalized? Because I think this is this is an important uh, aspect. And then maybe just uh, give some examples of how we work uh, with districts to do kind of what we've seen with the work that we've done with Fulton. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what she said, basically. Is yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, so probably don't know this, but over five years ago, we got involved in this conversation for personalized with a school district that's just north of, of our friends in Fulton in Hall County, Georgia. Um, and we went through a visioning process with them to say, you know, what should learning look like, all the things that Serena just mentioned. And at the end, they said, we really want it to be personalized and, and blended. And the concept was, you know, well, we'll just buy a learning management system, add another system to the equation, and that will solve the problem. And we, you know, said, well, hold on a second. How does that actually help you get to this, you know, outcome that you've discussed? It won't. It'll actually just create more complexity, right? So we went down this path of designing and supporting a learning platform. So even in what Serena has been talking about, there is a component that they're working on right now that brings with the LTI standards and all that interoperability of all of their resources together in a platform. So we learned a lot, <laughs> a lot. We failed to learn, just like we talked to our customers in the learning process with students, about what it truly takes to personalize learning. It's pretty simple to put up a definition and say, we believe in these things. It's much harder to actually roll up your sleeves and try to do this work with, with a school system. Um, so in that process, over the last five years, while we were working on that, everyone else decided personalized learning was the thing. So where we really differentiate this, and I think Serena did a good job with this, is that this is really about student voice and choice in the learning process. Um, you don't get too personalized if kids don't have voice and choice. You're at differentiated when the teacher has to do all the work, right? Um, you're at individualized many times when the computer technology is doing all the work. You're at personalized when students are bought in and empowered and they have voice and choice in the process. So from a Dell perspective, that's how we are helping to define it. And in everything that we do in a school system, from the beginning at the vision process, we bring students into that conversation. So we do visioning days. We don't do them if students aren't there. It doesn't make any sense to us. Why do they want to hear Adam Gary tell them what students think when they have a whole bunch of students just sitting right there that can tell them that stuff? So everything that we kind of do, the purpose-built stuff that we're working on, the professional learning that we support through the work that Snow's doing, is really based on this notion of voice and choice. Do you want to go to the next one? Yeah. Um, so... <clears throat> In that concept of voice and choice, then we have to obviously do lots of different things to help educate the market. One of the big things that I talk about is the fact that when you go into a school district, depending on who has educated the folks in that district, you can get a completely different definition of what student-centered is, project-based is, uh, personalized is. And so we believe that it's our purpose in, in this to also help educate our customers so that they can make really good and valid choices for students. So in that, we actually have a group of youth innovation advisors that we work with. These are students from all across the country that give us feedback that have also designed programs to empower student voice. Um, and they've wrapped this around helping students that are disenfranchised in the learning process, right? So they've got really cool projects they've worked on, and some of these students have actually been flown to Germany to participate in things because of the projects that they designed and that they're working on. Uh, I mentioned the visioning days. We do a ton of professional learning. So as Serena was talking, one of the ways we're engaging in Fulton is at those schools that are those um, phase three, four, and five, 
um, we're working with the instructional team to help those schools get ready so when they get to that part where they're doing their design thinking processes and stuff, they already have the things in place to actually be able to transition uh, into the personalized approach. It made sense um, because they had a lot of heavy lifting already going on with some of their other partners in some other areas, and we worked with Hoke, and he said, look, this is a place where we could really use your support. So that's where we'll be uh, also embarking from a professional learning uh, piece. Um, and we also have what's called a center of excellence. I don't know if any of you know where the Science Leadership Academy is in, uh, in Philadelphia. But if you don't know, uh, Chris Lehman is the leader of that school. It's one of the most amazing schools I've ever been in. Uh, it is completely inquiry-based um, and follows a lot of the principles that uh, Serena was talking about today. And it's something that they're scaling as well. Uh, as you can see, I first time I've seen these slides, I'm just taking a look <laughs> at this guy right here. Um, so this basically just wraps up all of the, of the stuff that I said. But again, in order to truly personalize, you need data, you need professional learning, you need to have the in infrastructure and all the technologies that support learning for all students. And th that's the kind of wrapper that we put around this. So I think that's enough from me. Um, I don't know if, um, well, I know you probably have a lot of questions. Yeah. So at this point, I'll run around with the mic and let Serena stand up here. I'm sure the questions are for her. And uh, we'll just take questions at this point. Oh, we got the thanks. May I ask if your district has a school home portal? When you say home for parents access, yes. It's off of our, uh, our uh, SIS, Home Access Center. It does not give them the teacher lesson plans. It gives them the grades and attendance information, and it's, it's more of what's going into our SIS than what's in our LMS or learning system. Uh, we, we want to enhance that in this process as well. When you said um, that you wouldn't roll out devices till the schools were ready, can you, do you have a definition for ready? Did you have a matrix? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So the, the readiness was that pie chart. Um, you know what? I want to back up because you, if you're talking about a rubric, there's something that would be more interesting. There, there is a rubric that goes yeah. behind it. Yeah, so I wanted to talk to you about the rubric. But, but, but this was, this, so this is when the school's readiness. But where we showed the five different groups, What's interesting is the way those schools got into the groups is by going through a rubric. So we started with the TIMS model and we enhanced it. So we customized it, we took a, a couple of different models and the principals did a self-evaluation using the rubric. And they actually placed themselves, they, they were like, whoa, this is a lot hard. Like, they thought they were just getting devices. And then when they saw the rubric, they're like, whoa, we have a lot of work to do. So, so we thought that, um, you know, everybody would mark themselves high on things, and they, they were like, ooh, I think we'll be four or five. And we've actually had to work to get some ready sooner than, you know, move them up so that we could spread out. Uh, so we did the rubric readiness for even starting the process. And then before they get the devices, though, we go, we go through this. And that instructional readiness is, um, there, there's an evaluation. We use our partners at Elements and, and others to evaluate the, the readiness at this point. I think that... This, this slide had some of those. And the cool thing about that is when we're going to go and do the professional learning in those other phases, we can use that rubric to see where they said they were yeah. weak. Yeah, you do a post and like yeah. a check using the same rubric. Yeah. Thank you. So if a school is a four or five. In the group four or five? Right. So they're not going to be seeing this new technology. Yeah. What technology do they have? during that time? So what they have now is interactive projectors and they have uh, classroom devices. So our, our standard in every classroom has been at least uh, three computers in the back. Is that for, that's for elementary. Uh, elementary, they have devices in the classroom. In high school we have CTE labs, we have computer labs, and we have uh, checkout mobile carts. So students do have access to technology, it's just not one-to-one -one in those schools that don't have the devices yet. And they're usually more laptops rather than more of a mobile device. Do you have a strategy uh, for achieving that anytime, anywhere access, particularly in the areas of your district that are the, the low SES areas? Yeah, that's a great question. We kind of struggle with that because we're giving them devices and we realize some kids are not going to have internet access at home. 
Uh, and we even struggle with, should we allow those kids to take them home? Because for that population, it may not be helpful. Um, there is some Comcast, uh, what is it called, Comcast? Connect, um, the essentials? Essentials, yeah. Essentials. essentials. They have a program, and they met with us. So we, we try to publicize the Comcast Essentials, which is $9.99 a month for Internet access. And then we're also looking at maybe some grants for those families that even that's too much. Um, we've also, we have a lot of Google presence, and we're, Atlanta is one of the cities that Google Fiber is rolling out to. So we've talked about um, them putting that access in community centers in South Bolton. And uh, so they're doing that as well. So there'll be libraries, community centers, of course, Starbucks, but there aren't a whole lot of Starbucks in the rural areas. Uh, and then they have their loons. You know, the Google loons that give you access. So we're working with the different providers. My question is back to uh, the readiness. Do you all run those readiness uh, parallel, or do you do one and then the other? How do you do that? Do you mean the assessment or the getting Yeah, the ready? assessment and making sure they are, quote, ready or not ready. Uh, well, so the assessment to get into a group was done at a principal work session. So all the principals took the rubric, the readiness, to get in a group initially. And then, um, let me see where that slide is. I don't remember where my slide is. Oh. So this is, they have an 18 month, so once they're in a group, they're in an 18-month planning process, and as they work with the coaches and, and the consultants, they'll determine in that process. So it could be, it, it isn't a set time. It's, it's the same thing. It's competency. It's mastery. So when they have mastered the instructional practices and they have their goals set, they've gone to their governance, and then, then they can select the devices. I, I had one other follow-up on it. I know your infrastructure piece, uh, do you do that just in time, or do you have to have that ready before you go to the next phase because yeah. so Kenny doubled the size the number of access points a year and a half two years ago and to get even more ready we have a project plan that um, they implement you know before all of these so we don't have what do we have now 7,000 7, yeah so we have about 7,000 access points across 100 schools and the last push of putting the access points in we make sure they're in before we deploy the devices. And then your bandwidth to school, do you do that just in time? Because I saw you, you said something about 10 gig earlier. Yeah, do you want to stand? You wanna... Yes, uh, our high schools, thank you. Our high schools currently have 10 gig. We are in the process of rolling out a new wide area network to our schools um, that will provide a minimum of two gig to elementary, five gig to middle, and the the high schools will stay at 10 gig. It is dynamic. If the high school doesn't turns out doesn't need 10 gig, we have the ability to scale it back. We also have the ability to scale up uh, for the school, maybe a larger elementary school that may need more than 2 gig. Uh, but currently, uh, all elementary and middle have 1 gig, and high schools have 10. And we are in the process of rolling out a larger bandwidth um, on a new design. And it's and, it, and it's also kind of an adjust in time model um, to uh, to accomplish the one to one. Um, repeat the question. The ISP's bandwidth. We have two ISP's. Uh, we have two 10 gig uh, links coming into our data center uh, from AT&T, and then we also have a, a 3 gig that I'm probably going to take to 5 gig, so I'm going to have uh, about 25 gig of Internet bandwidth coming into our data center. I wanted to make one more point I forgot to mention. So with getting the teachers ready, that's kind of the biggest challenge. And one of the ways that we approach that, I think uh, I give the credit to the folks that have been there before, before I got there, they established a group called the Vanguard Team. And they took teachers that were already tech savvy and really loved technology and were maybe even using it in their classrooms. And they said, hey, do you want to learn some more about technology and teaching? And they were like, great. And they gave them an iPad. They gave them $1,000 to spend on apps for their school. And these Vanguard teachers grew from 20 to 40 to 100, and now they're 200, and we're going to double that again, and we're going to have four per school. So it'll be 400 Vanguard teachers that help the other teachers integrate technology into their classroom. And these are full-time teachers. They teach, and then on the side, they help the other teachers. And 60 of them took a bus up to ISTE um, in the summer. Yeah, did you see them? Yeah, they, yeah, so they all had matching shirts, and these are the most you know, energetic, engaged group of teachers. And you know they get some perks, but we don't pay them more. We just treat them well and 
teach them more about technology and give them perks like the bus trip, 15 hours in a bus to ISTE. So <laughs> that's a perk. That's a perk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's not a hard thing to do. It doesn't take a lot of money to do that. I mean, we are blessed in Fulton County where we do have a tax that has given us um, enough spending, uh, enough budget to cover a lot of these things. But I also have seen districts do it on less money, and, and the loss is never guaranteed. So we, we may have to cut back at some point, but we've been fortunate to be able to beef up our network and, um, and roll out the devices with, with the money we do have. Yes? Does part of the readiness plan include the schools actually uh, identifying how they're going to use the technology, like specific? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So they actually have simulation, they have sessions, they go through uh, programs where the consultants lead specific classes in, in an exercise. Like so they might have like a you know a three month effort where the students are doing collaborative learning using the devices, and, and they do have very specific goals. The other thing I wanted to mention is with the device readiness, it's really important to know how the devices are going to be stored, secured, replaced if they're broken within that. So there's somebody in that school that needs to be responsible for those devices. And there's got to be you know, hot swappables, there has to be some spares there. And, and that's part of the device readiness. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? We have a lot of information on our website, and I'm happy to provide more specifics. I'm not sure how often that gets updated, but we're constantly learning and publishing and producing uh, artifacts. So thank you very much. You've been a great we audience. Have one oh, more. We have one more. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. Go no, ahead. it's fine. Um, talking about providing opportunities for choice with the devices. Yes. Do you foresee challenges kind of supporting and maintaining different, you know, product platforms and what are your strategies? Because I know you, you don't necessarily have all the schools, but when you have hundreds of schools and each one's running different or a combination thereof, yeah. how do you plan to manage that? Yeah, and that's a great question. I wanted to bring up the point that we decided that IT should take on that complexity so that the schools and the students have the best choices for what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and we feel that we can support that. We have tested all those devices with our apps. Most of our apps and tools that they're going to be using are browser-based anyway. So they work with Office 365, so that fits in well. Um, w w I guess we'll have to give credit to Dell. So Dell is going to be helping us support all four devices, and I think that takes a lot of the complexity out of it when you have a great partner that can support all the different brands and devices. Um, you know, Kenny, do you want to say anything about supporting the devices? I don't, I think we've pretty ha much handled that. Yeah, uh, it's it's a, a bit they're managed. Uh, uh, they're they're going to be managing the repair, the uh, uh, the replacements. Um, I do not have the staff to manage to, to handle that many uh, individual devices. Uh, so Dell Dell is a great partner in that in, in there that they're even helping us manage the the, the iPad. And AirWatch, AirWatch, and AirWatch is, is, uh, it, is our management platform across the board. And that works for all of that. So. Uh, we have several sites already rolled out, and we already did have a lot of technology. So we have about 20, 20 or 30,000 iPads in the district already. So what, what has been, what have they been picked? the elementary schools, we think, are going to go more iPad. Um, then we think that the middle and high will go more of the other devices. Uh, one other thing that we did is for the, the Dell Latitude uh, Chromebook and Windows books, we said if, if you buy, if, you, if the school chooses, so the, so the budget, the schools never see the budget. It's just they're, def, they're only choosing based on what's right for their school from an instructional basis. And if they choose the Dell books, we are giving them an additional coach, instructional coach. So it makes sense for a lot of the schools that um, are struggling and maybe the groups four and five and three and four and five that need more help, they are um, using, we think they're gonna choose the Dell books and the additional support. Are you, are you an active director in Meyer? Yes. We're, we're working with Google. Uh, there, there is actually some AV integration tools. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, how we're going to handle Google. Uh, Google actually has some AD integration with pieces. With Active Directory. With Active Directory. Uh, and we're currently working through that process. Come back up here. We just turn them upside down on a copier. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. That's fine. We're good. We got plenty yeah, we're of time. Good on, we're no, good we're plenty of time. time. We're good. So, so I have just two questions, if I could. The first is, how have you 
accounted for the transition from administrators and teachers as they move between schools? And the second question, uh, do you have any union-related issues that you had to deal with? We're very fortunate that we're not unionized. So yes. Thank uh, goodness. Okay. But no, we don't have the union. But when you, what do you mean the administrators? Because of the student devices being different? No, sorry. Principals, assistant principals moving between schools, teachers moving between schools. Let's say you have a stage one school. Oh, okay. People move from that school to a stage four for whatever reason. Would that ever happen or vice versa? Yeah, since the whole district is going through this process, I don't think it's, they're just in different stages of it, and they're all being exposed to it, even in small, even the ones that are groups four and five. I mean, it's over a two-year period. It's not like it's over five or, you know, so they're all being exposed now anyway. And um, as, the, as what we actually were more concerned about is if an elementary school went one-to-one, -one, and then they went to a middle school that was not. So we had to align our feeder pattern so that the middle school would feed to a high school with one to one. So we did we did think about that. Last question. Uh, sure. Okay. I don't we can hear you. Um, I can repeat. So just on that note, do you have your school spoken with families that are sort of uh, overseen by trustees, or how is the knowledge shared between the different school board members? Do you have any yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great question, and we're, we're very focused on equity across the district, especially with the North-South, um, you know, being so diverse. Um, <clears throat> we are fortunate that we are actually a charter district within the state of Georgia. So it is a public district, so we are, you know, held to the, to the state standards for education, but we have a special status called charter, which allows us flexibility in seat time and, and allows us to do this personalized learning. So part of the charter status, we had to have every school form its own governance council and its own strategic plan. So we have a board of directors for the entire district. It's um, seven, seven women. And then every school has its own governance. And we have every seat filled. In fact, we had multiple people running for seats. So it's, it's actually gone really well. We have a lot of community involvement across every single school in the district. And that local governance has um, really bolstered this process and and they understand it and we're moving forward uh, and they would be the ones that will uh, um, after the evaluation they will be the ones that approve the actual device for that school and we don't really see it as a problem if you go from an iPad in elementary and then you know you have a you know Windows device in middle school and high school we think that's a natural transition so I want to go back to um, talking about the school selecting their device and you said that if they choose the Dell book, that you give them an extra instructional coach. Okay, right. so talk to us about, you know, d does that is that person dedicated to that school? Yes. And is that funded from the school's budget, from the district? Right. Is it a, you know, right. it's a teacher? So, well, How does it it's work? not a, so we have uh, Ed Elements and KSU, we have consultants that are helping get the, get the schools ready, helping them integrate technology into their instructional practices. So we have a fund, a bucket of money for this whole one-to-one -one device rollout. For those schools that choose the Dell books, we're going to use some of that money to give them um, a part-time additional consultant, a coach. So it's part-time and it's over um, a two-year period. And uh, so that gives them additional support to help make that transition to using the technology. And it's district funded, so the, the schools don't have to worry about that. And it, and it fits really well with some of the schools that are, you know, they're struggling. They, you know, they are not so technology oriented. And the device itself is, you know, they don't need all the bells and whistles. They just, they just need something that the, school, the students can use, but they really need, need more, um, right, emotional <laughs> support. <laughs> right. 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 Oh yeah, they're not doing it for them. They're teaching them. They're, it's it's a knowledge transfer, and it's a you know truly it has to be a learning process so that the school and the teachers and they, they have to own it. You know the coaches are there to coach, not to do it for them. So yes, sure. I may have missed this, um, but let's go back to the device selection. Is this a committee that does uh, make the selection per each of the uh, schools? Yes. And what is the makeup of that committee? Uh, interesting question. I, I don't know if I have a great answer. It is school-based. So that school, 
forms a committee to decide which device makes sense based on their instructional needs. So they went through, they're going through this process. They may be in this learning process, and um, I think I showed you the slide with all the different work sessions and listening and learning. <laughs> and so somewhere in there, they're going to say, well, this is what we're trying to achieve, you know, and, and this device makes the most sense. And that committee, um, I don't know exactly who it's comprised of. All I've been told, if they are a zealot, they're not on the committee. So it's going to be uh, educators. I think they want to have a, com a community member. Um, educators, I, they may have a student on there as well. Uh, but it's, it's folks within the school that are closest to developing those instructional goals and practices. I was looking to see if I, I wanted to see if there was student representation on the committee. Yeah, I believe there is. I think there is some flexibility. Um, like I said, we, we really believe in autonomy at the school level, and so I think the schools may have some autonomy as to who goes into those committees. So before we say thank you, John Phillips um, is just going to bring us home here. Yeah, sure. So yeah, before we say thanks for this wonderful time, we're, we're actually right on time. We did a, you did a great job of allowing for a lot of QA, so we really appreciate that. But, uh, so we, Adele, you could you could probably get a sense in Dell Education, and I, I run worldwide education um, for Dell, and I'm I'm really uh, blessed to have team members like Adam and, and Snow and others that aren't here that really understand what it what it's like to be in the seat of uh, a practitioner. And so, if there's one thing I want to press upon you as you leave today, is you're thinking of Dell, and you know you probably heard Michael and. Uh, and the team talk about Dell's committed to the PC, we're committed to the device. Know that, you know, for us in education, that's really, the, as, as Serena said, that's the last piece of this, of this puzzle that we're putting together in education. And we believe it starts with that vision and it starts with professional learning and, and all the things that you're seeing. And we're, we're, we're just really fortunate to work with great uh, district leaders like we see here and great leadership on, um, on the IT side and teaching and learning side. So, um, Serena, we want to thank you and all the great work you're doing at Fulton. I think you're a, a, a beacon, a light out there. Um, and one great thing about education is we share, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you have further follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to the Fulton team. Don't hesitate to reach out to Adam or myself or a Dell team member. We'd love to come and understand what your vision is and how we can help you achieve what you want to do. So thank you, everybody, for, for attending. And thank you, Serena. Thank you.